present threat from surface to surface or surface to air missile, from either shore stations or missile carrying Soviet ships. The basic problem is that our stable of Navy fighters to meet these threats is rapidly losing its edge. Our F-8 Crusader was started in late 1952, over 15 years ago. It became operational 11 years ago. Our F-4 was a clearly superior fighter when it became operational in 1961. Now the gap is closing. It is a tribute to the skill of the nation's fighter pilots that a high kill ratio has been maintained in Vietnam. We cannot depend on maintaining this margin indefinitely. The time has come to equal the skill of our fighter pilots with a far superior fighter aircraft, one that will be superior now and for the next 15 years. With vast experience gained from the F-111B, Grumman had already made moves to produce a suitable defense fighter to fill the void described by Connolly. Grumman experimented with a variety of models and weapons formats to try and produce a concept that could both act as a dogfighter as well as a fleet defense fighter. Their Model 303 clearly filled the requirement. Benefiting from lessons learned in the TFX program, the new aircraft was to rely upon expensive but proven materials such as boron and titanium. The wing box area was doubly strengthened against failure. Two turbofan engines would provide speed and economy, and two separate fins would ensure aircraft stability should one engine fail. The Model 303 was to carry the widest weapon spectrum of any warbird then in service. It carried an M61 cannon for close encounters and dogfighting. The traditional short and medium range Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles. And the long range, deadly accurate Phoenix. The time I was flying the Phantom, uh, that was considered the world's foremost fighter at the time. And it had served very well in Vietnam and it was used in a number of uh, other parts of the world. And it was, like I say, about the best all around fighter aircraft in the world. And so it was really a little bit of a letdown almost to go to something like an F-14 that all of a sudden made the Phantom look obsolete. And in that regard, it would out-accelerate the Phantom, it would out-turn the Phantom, uh, it would out-weapon system the Phantom. So everything that we were so proud of our F-4 Phantom for, uh, all of a sudden was left behind in the dust. The concept behind Model 303 would be a lesson to all aircraft builders faced with the problem of having to provide an aircraft that would not only bring them into line with enemy weaponry, but also, because of the cost of development, ensure that a single plane could maintain a competitive edge for years to come. By the 21st of December, 1970, the prototype now referred to as the F-14 and named Tomcat was ready for its maiden flight at Calverton, New York. Test pilots Bob Smythe and Bill Miller had to wait all day for final adjustments. It was only in the late afternoon and with the threat of snow the following day that they finally got aircraft number one into the air. The flight only lasted 10 minutes and was generally uneventful. Both pilots said that the Tomcat behaved well. Next day, the weather turned nasty. It would be nine more days before it was safe to fly the Tomcat again. This time, Miller was to take the front position and Bob Smythe the rear. And the flight was to be anything but uneventful.
Prototype number one had not been in the air long when its chase plane noticed what seemed to be smoke coming from the aircraft. In fact, it was hydraulic oil leaking under pressure. Within minutes, all of the control surfaces of the plane ceased to function as the pilots made their approach through the cold morning air. feet from the ground, when there was no possible likelihood that the plane would reach the runway, the pilots ejected. Four seconds later, prototype number one ceased to exist. Here is how it looked from the ground camera recording the event. In late August, another aircraft, originally scheduled as number 12, now redesignated 1X as a replacement of the ill-fated original prototype, was wheeled out of Grumman's Calverton plant. By now, Smythe, Miller, and the other test pilots had established a real affinity for what Grumman was convinced was the answer to the Navy's problem. But other manufacturers and the natural pessimism of Congress had yet to be overcome. And while the Navy had confidence in the Tomcat concept, there were still many trials ahead. Because at no stage was Model 303 to be a cheap aircraft. The sort of money invested and the commitment necessary were already putting Grumman under considerable pressure. Throughout 1971, ground-based testing of the first prototypes continued. These aircraft were put through severe testing when little was known about how they would react. Here is prototype number two with a complete ordnance load achieving the almost unachievable.
Here it is again, affecting an induced stall. Throughout the entire prototype program, several aircraft were made with no intention of ever being flown. Their sole purpose was to be tested to destruction. By this method, it was hoped that any flaws in design or manufacture would be identified. Prior to carrier testing, a prototype was catapult tested at Patuxent River Naval Air Station. And on June 28, 1972, the first Tomcat flown by a Navy pilot landed on the aircraft carrier Forrestal off Norfolk. After a series of touch and goes, the landing was affected by aircraft number 10. But within minutes, a small malfunction appeared. The two pilots were informed of a leak in the hydraulics of the nose gear. On hand as a minor adjustment was made was Bill Miller. look on the faces of the Navy's test pilot said everything. Because this film of the first carrier landing was to be flown to the Congressional Committee for a final decision on the Tomcat within hours. As it happened, the committee gave the project full endorsement. But elation at Grumman was short-lived, because just 24 hours later, Bill Miller's luck ran out. Flying this same aircraft, he made a minor technical oversight that cost him his life. You bump into a lot of situations out on the carrier where there is not a cut and dried set of rules and there's not a cut and dried set of policies that say the carrier guarantees me that I will have these conditions on landing. You're going to go out there and you're going to fly and when you come back you're going to look for where the carrier is supposed to be regardless of where they told you it was going to be. You're going to look for where it really is and then whatever the conditions are you're going to land on. If you come back and the weather doesn't suit your minimums it really doesn't matter. That's the only place you have to land. And so therefore, you may have to bend the weather a little bit. Uh, that doesn't happen often, but it is, it's, it's an example of the, the, the sort of difference that you see between the way the Navy has to operate and the way the Air Force has to operate. By late 1972, full-scale production of the F-14 was in progress. The Tomcat was no longer a prototype. It was now the Navy's fighter of the future. The spectacular firepower of the F-14 was spotlighted in Operation 6 on 6. Time one four four zero straight up. 